Good evening, uh, residents of Everett, Washington. I'd like to call the order of the Everett City Council meeting of March 27th, 2024. The City Council meets all requirements of the State of Washington Open Public Meetings Act. Community members are welcome to join either in person, remote via Zoom, or by calling in. For those who wish to participate in, the, in future meetings via Zoom, you'll find in the instructions to register for public comment on the City of Everett website under the City Council Department. Please note we do not allow comments of any kind or of campaigning, whether or against ballot measures or candidates running for office. We also do not accept comments focused on personal matters that are unrelated to city business. We ask that the audience refrain from clapping, cheering, or booing, and no signs of any kind are allowed to be in the chambers. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Mayor Franklin? Here. Councilmember Fossey? Here. Vice President Zarlingo? Here. Councilmember Vogley? Here. Councilmember Bader? Here. Councilmember Ryan? Here. Councilmember Tui? Here. President Schwab? Here. Clerk, um, thank you. Um, I would like to ask Councilmember Zarlingo to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'd like to ask Council Member Vogley to read the land acknowledgement. Thank you. The City Council wishes to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place, the Stahoksh people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on, and taken care of these lands and waters. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. Thank you. Do I hear a motion for approval of the minutes for March 20th, 2024? Councilor Ryan, so moves. Second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Clerk, please take the roll. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Vice President Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. Council Member Bader? Abstain. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Yes. Uh, well, good evening, Mayor. Uh, good evening. No comment, no report this evening. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, hi, Angie. Do we have anyone signed up to speak tonight? We do. We have two people in chambers. Um, we did receive one written comment from Craig Scuttle regarding Park District and that was um, given to legal and city clerk and council. Um, and we'll start with Jose. If you could please come to the podium. And please state your full name, city of residence, press the right button on the base of the microphone. And um, you'll have three minutes to speak and there's a timing system there to the right of you when the light turns yellow. That means you have 30 seconds and you have to wrap up. Okay. Thank right. you. Go Thank ahead. you. Uh, Jose Villalaz. Uh, I live in Everett, uh, Poor Gardner neighborhood, District 2. I've been a resident of Everett for 10 years. Um, I wanted to start uh, by saying thank you to the mayor, the city council, uh, the police department, Chief DeRuz, uh, countless police officers that I've spoken to. Um, and uh, this is regarding the buffer zone that will be taking effect next week. Uh, at 3301 um, Lombard Avenue. Uh, it's been three years since Andy's place uh, opened. And um, I'm saying thank you for the buffer zone because in our neighborhood, we, we know that this is just a temporary and it's a tool. Um, but going forward, uh, what we are looking for from Compass Health is gonna be accountability and that they recognize that security and safety is important to the people who live in that neighborhood. It's not just um, a statement. We live there. Many of us work here in the city of Everett. We've made Everett our home. Um, when Andy's place opened, um, I, we noticed the change immediately because we started to see um, things that were not happening often, but they started to <clears throat> magnify. Vandalism, uh, we've all had our homes vandalized in, on Lombard Avenue, 33rd, 34th Oaks, and the surrounding area. Uh, we've seen a uh, large amount of people hanging out in the alleys, drug use. We've seen homeless people camping out around the Compass Health campus. We've had a large amount of vehicles. We've seen drug dealers um, 
And we've seen, I mean, uh, that has generated a lot of calls because I've placed of them and also a lot of my neighbors. Um, that's what led for our neighborhood to take, when the city passed the buffer zone ordinance two years ago, we decided to take advantage of that because we wanted something to, to be put in to help us. But going forward, we know that this is only a temporary tool. So I'm letting the city council and also the mayor know that what we are asking for is to continue to press compass. There is a lot of time and money being invested into the phase two facility. It is currently under construction. And we know that once it opens, it's going to provide more services. If they are having problems with security, this is the time that they need to take to implement better security so that they can provide services to the people who need it, but also to provide a, a safety net so that the street level issues don't get out of control. It can't end up in our front lawns like it's ended up for many years. It can't be that every time I come after work or early in the morning, I have to find trash and drug needles or people hanging out behind my house or in the alleyways. It becomes a safety issue for the entire neighborhood. So um, again, thank you for passing the buffer zone and thank you for uh, listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, if Marilyn could please come to the podium. And please state your full name okay. and city of residence. Yep. You have three minutes to speak. Okay, great. My name is Marilyn Rosenberg. I live here in Everett. I've been a resident <clears throat> since the early 90s. I'm in the um, District 1. And um, I've been involved since last fall with the Everett Film Festival. It's an organization that's been around for 27 years in Everett. We put on an event once a year. We spend the year picking the best films we can find that um, put a spotlight on women in film, getting their voices out locally and around the world. And um, our event's a week from Saturday, so I just wanted to promote it here, um, let people know about it. I, I find it really hard to promote local things and really get the word out. I mean, there's social media, but I wish there was more city sites to really um, promote things like this. And um, it's over at the Everett Performing Arts Center. It's Saturday, April 6th. It's an all-day event, and we only do this once a year, and it starts at 1 o'clock. And you can go to everettfilmfestival.org to get more information. But inviting everybody here and hope to see people. Thank you. Marilyn, I'm, I'm just urging you to connect with Jennifer to make sure we have all the information so that we can put it on our information tours, okay. our tourism okay. page That'd be and everything great. for you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah. You. thank you. We also thank just you. run on volunteers and we've never had one paid position on this um, with this organization. So it's people so dedicated to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Chelsea, if you could please come to the podium. And please state your full name and city of residence. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, Chelsea Gray, city of Everett, nine years. This is my, gosh, 12th, 12th meeting. Um, so you guys know what I'm here about uh, quite well. Um, it, it started back in October with um, feces, which seems comical now. Um, and then it spread to flipper zero attacks. And um, now the public library, uh, every machine has got um, an attack loaded on there that uh, you know steals the remote uh, control of the settings for really all operating systems. So Android 13, um, Linux, Windows, all of them. And any of you can go and see for yourself, or you can send your your tech experts there. I personally pulled it off of the machine. Um, onto a USB as well as the encryption key um, because I did try to look in the files without the key and of course it's a bunch of nonsense. Um, there are also generic crypto services underneath it um, which I mean I don't know if you guys think that's a normal thing to be on a library computer or all library computers but I, I can assure you that it isn't. Um, the library and the city don't want people trading in crypto uh, on their library machines. Um, I would urge you guys to take a look at them. Um, obviously, I have. Um, and have now got to spend even more thousands to have 
that uh, analyzed by an expert, unless I can learn to do it myself. Whoops. I become pretty tech savvy, but, um, but these are really, they are coordinated attacks. And I just wanted, you know, to say on the record, in case something happens to me, you guys have a faction of organized crime. Um, flourishing here in Everett underneath all of your noses. And uh, I know it's new. I know Flipper Zero is new, um, but it's really past that now. Um, these are coded attacks onto public and private machines for all commercially available operating systems available today. Um, and they can, they can, I'm not, your officers ask me over and over what's so special about you that somebody would want to, to stalk you or, or unleash these sort of attacks on me. I mean, the real answer to that question is nothing. Nothing is so special about me. I don't have a ton of money um, or, you know, a ton of, I mean, all my data is gone, but I'm the same person in front of you here and in real life that I am online, so that has a limited effect on me. Um, but somebody should look at these because if they impact you, it's going to be severe and instant and you won't know how to get your life back and neither will anybody in the city of Everett. Police, city council, so. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comments. Um, yeah, good. And there was one more item. It didn't make the agenda. A very special day tomorrow to the person that keeps the council, the glue that holds the council together. So um, happy birthday, Angie. And um, they're uh, not only flowers, but evidently they're. Thank you, guys. <laughs> And thank you for your hard work. Okay, so moving on to council comments and liaison report. Um, council Member Fossey. Thank you. Um, and uh, again, always appreciative of public com comments um, and the community coming to speak. Uh, on the uh, Everett Film Festival, um, Thank you for sharing that information uh, about uh, April 6th. I didn't realize it was coming up so soon. Um, when community has um, these awesome longstanding events and other things going on and things that are volunteered, what are the avenues, um, and if the city could share something super brief, of uh, where they should reach out to help with that kind of publicity and sharing the information through the city? Is, is it something where um, the city can include it in like council neighborhoods information or is it something where they would just contact Jennifer and, and there's a newsletter or anything like that? Uh, so uh, like the easiest thing on the spot that I can think of would be uh, potentially, you know, just starting with the mayor's office or obviously with myself. Um, we have city newsletter, we've got calendar um, that's community driven, so the calendar on the website. Uh, our communications team's always pushing stuff out to neighborhood leaders to share with neighborhoods. Um, social media, we can, we've, I've, the request has already been made to help boost their event to our social media folks, uh, and I'm just thinking about where else they might be best connected. But that's kind of a good place to start. Um, awesome. And yeah, and then we can redirect them. So to our economic development and placemaking team is really good at even if it's not a hosted event by the city or, or co-sponsored or anything like that, just kind of mentoring and providing ideas and feedback and things like that. That is wonderful, especially um, given a lot of, you know, these longstanding uh, traditions and events and things that we have that are volunteer run and very community oriented. So I'm, I'm so thankful for all that the city does in trying yeah. to promote those things. There's a lot of great folks in the mayor's office that, that work to make those, to help make those things successful for the community, so. Awesome. Um, today we did have um, our stadium fiscal advisory uh, council, council or committee, the first meeting that we kind of had, and I am blown away by the folks that are on there with the amount of expertise that they have. Uh, and so it was a very productive meeting. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the other things being discussed. Uh, the next one will be live streamed um, on April 17th. 
Um, and so uh, pay attention to that. Uh, these things will be moving rather quickly when it comes to the information being presented, and uh, I think it's pretty exciting stuff. So um, we had the Safe Community uh, meeting today, and I am sure uh, Council Member Tui will probably talk more about that. Uh, last uh, week, we had the State of the City. I'm surprised you didn't talk I about. I enough last week <laughs> it for all of us. <laughs> that, um, I was very, very impressed with how many people showed up and the kind of the, the use of, of the mall. I didn't realize that it, it would be such an amazing venue for that. And, um, I was, uh, I was very impressed. So uh, the state of the city, um, I'm sure people can watch it. Some It's online. Um, it's but all available free online. It's long, but it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your uh, popcorn. Yeah, yeah, but it was, uh, it was very informative, and uh, it was just really nice to see that kind of revitalization <coughs> in our, our mall and being used for, for those purposes. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to be happening with our, our mall and the design there. Uh, I was also able to attend the, the Northwest Neighborhood, and they had uh, uh, the Everett Housing Authority present information to them um, and for uh, those that celebrate I'm sure a lot of you know that um, Easter is coming up this weekend uh, so they had mentioned that at the Drew Nielsen Park there's a little um, Easter egg hunt and so I know there's a lot of activities probably this weekend so make sure to uh, look those up in your community to see where you want to go if you celebrate that and if you celebrate April Fool's Day that's also coming up so that's all. Thank you Councilmember Zarlinko. Uh, well, I'll second the comments about the state of the city. Actually, I'd like to thank all those who set up that space, uh, a neat use of the space. It was, a, it was a great venue, and in my district, I'm happy to have that there. Uh, I, last week, I attended the, uh, the dedication or the groundbreaking for the PUD uh, and Everett Public Works solar installation on uh, West Casino Road. This is on Everett Public Works property. This came before the council, I don't know, a year and a half ago, something like that. Um, I was there with council members Ryan and Vogley, and uh, I really impressed by a lot of what went on. It was, um, it's something funded by a Department of Commerce grant uh, with the PUD at Everett Public Works working together. Um, it'll emphasize or enhance some power and resilience there. Um, I discussed some of these things with our Public Works Director and also the PUD um, Commission President Sidney Logan uh, and Vice President Tanya Olson. Um, Mr. Logan in particular was deeply familiar with this project and mentioned a previous one that had been operating I think in the Arlington area. Um, it'll generate enough power for several dozen homes, but importantly, it improves power distribution in that area. And again, that may be a, an enhancement in terms of resiliency in difficult times. Um, and I'm happy to see this kind of cooperative effort because it leverages in these very tight fiscal times, it leverages city resources and others like the Department of Commerce to the greatest extent possible for the benefit of the community here. So a win on all counts as far as I can tell. I really don't see a downside. Also saw a large community garden patch in the area, which was a great thing to see. There were other aspects of this that I thought were neat, uh, including uh, some uh, connector path that will be enhanced and some art. But uh, Council Members Ryan and Vogley know more about that than I will, so I'll, I'll defer to them on, on that. Um, Attended yesterday the first meeting of the year on uh, the of the Snohomish County Law and Justice Council. Uh, this is members of the County Council, County Prosecutor, and the Sheriff. A uh, wide variety of people with different roles in law enforcement and the justice system, along with other elected officials and, importantly, community representatives here. Uh, it's an effort to connect the elements of the system to make it work better for everyone. One of these things that you don't, until you get these groups together, understand missed connections, dropped balls, and, and some problems that can be avoided. So I look forward to meeting again with them and, and learning more. Um, last night, uh, attended the Pinehurst Beverly Park neighborhood meeting, a very active meeting, uh, planning activities to connect with each other uh, and build on the work of the Boys and Girls Club. They're where we meet and improve the health, um, functionality, and safety of, of a real treasure of, our, of the city's there, Lions Park, which has certainly been under, been under some pressure. Um, also, a quick comment, uh, reading a letter to the editor, to the our Ever Daily Herald, uh, came a couple of days ago with a very, uh, about the fiscal measures we're considering, um, a letter that came with kind of a skeptical tone. Uh, questions not only, though, about what city might the city might cut or what these fiscal measures might provide in terms of uh, enhancement or preservation of services and the quality of life choices that go with that, and um, whether 
whether you're skeptical or not, whether you write into the paper or not, I really do welcome that kind of input. I'll read all I can find uh, because that's, that's what we are needing here at this stage of the game. Uh, we want to welcome all the questions, the concerns, uh, what the trade-offs we're going to be looking at will mean to you. So uh, thanks to those, whether you're skeptical or even cynical about it or not, we want all the viewpoints. I think just like we're entertaining in the Fiscal Advisory Committee for the stadium, we want to make sure that all those questions we might think in the future, oh, gee, we should have asked that, that we look back and we've asked them all and more. Um, one other meeting today, Snohomish County tomorrow. Uh, very, some very interesting things going on, but I'll leave that until my comments next week to avoid these taking too long. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Vogley. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jose, thank you for coming and speaking, and I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that you know and we know it's only temporary and there's lots of work to be done to make hopefully the buffer zones obsolete because we will have services aplenty um, and thank you Marilyn and Chelsea again for showing up uh, yes I was indeed at the ribbon cutting for the PUD solar panels um, at Walter Hall Park and um, that was a good time <laughs> And let's see, that's all. Thank you. Councilmember Bader. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Councilmember Bader. Thanks, yes. Uh, I just wanted to make sure she was complete. Understood. Thanks, Council President. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, uh, I was at the Delta Neighborhood meeting last Thursday, and uh, much like the Northwest Neighborhood, uh, the Everett Housing Authority Park District was the uh, main topic of conversation. So very good meeting, good turnout. So uh, <coughs> uh, glad to be there. I also went to the Council Neighborhoods meeting as our liaison uh, uh, last, uh, last yesterday, actually, and uh, the mayor gave a good presentation on the uh, revenue options we're considering and uh, answered a lot of questions on that. Uh, <coughs> uh, our, our budget challenges were uh, certainly underlined by uh, later comments that uh, uh, counts that neighborhood leaders made about the challenges that they have with lack of uh, resources and support but you know obviously we know that's a, a budget issue for us so uh, but uh, obviously sharing sharing that and I think all of us know that um, they mentioned uh, uh, this year coming up some big projects for them uh, that they're working with uh, and the city's helping uh, helping do uh, uh, the uh, neighbor cleanup day on May 18th and national night out on August 6th so uh, looking forward to those and just want to say a big uh, shout out of thank you and appreciate hard, the hard work of all our neighborhood leaders for they do. It's underlined every time I go to the council neighborhoods meeting. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, council Member Ryan. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I also attended the uh, Stomish County PUD uh, community solar project and groundbreaking event. It was uh, really lovely. Thank you for uh, Council Member Zerlingo. Uh, Gave wonderful highlights about the project itself and one of the aspects of it that I really appreciate is um, their commitment to centering the voices of the community that the project's going to be in so they did a amazing work at uh, outreach and engagement of the community of what types of features the community would like to see in the in the project including the name itself and the community chose uh, El Sol Al Aconse de Tus Manos the sun at your fingertips which I think is just a really beautiful way of uh, naming the project so and there's going to be um, local art and artists that's incorporated in the project as well so um, as I love to share the only thing better than a groundbreaking is a ribbon cutting so I look forward to uh, that in the future um, last night I attended the uh, historic commission meeting uh, there was a couple amazing topics that uh, were shared first uh, was uh, the commission was considering a designation of the 1611 apex building uh, to put it on the historic registry for the city of Everett and the uh, there was a fantastic presentation from Sherry with Apex about the amazing work that they've done to restore the building, the careful attention to detail of all of the features and just really bringing that uh, building back to life and making it a community hub and a community center and really celebrating the history of the building and what it could do uh, to just revitalize the space and just uh, was a great um, reminder of the importance of building owners and the commitment of building owners to uh, celebrate buildings and the historic nature of many of the buildings here in Everett to uh, just make Everett a great place to be and our downtown space is wonderful. So uh, the commission uh, unanimously approved the recommendation to put it on the registry, which will come before council uh, sometime in the future. So looking forward to 
um, that come in before us. Uh, they also uh, had a continued discussion about the Clark Park gazebo. <clears throat> the uh, action item before the commission was to approve a certificate of appropriateness uh, so for uh, the recommendation from Parks Department to dismantle the gazebo and put in a dog park in that place to and the certificate of appropriateness is a signal by the commission to say that yes that's an appropriate use of this historic park uh, there was some discussion about uh, the two different avenues of how the commission could make that designation so there's a certificate of appropriateness or a waiver of appropriateness and each of those uh, kind of have a different track after approval so it's still on hold waiting for uh, legal's input on uh, which of those um, indications the commission can give one would then come before council uh, for us to approve and the other would just go to planning so more on that to come next month uh, Jose thank you for joining again I appreciate seeing you and I really appreciate I know your neighbors appreciate your voice as well to to continue to make sure that uh, there's focus put on public safety issues in the in your neighborhood um, with both of my hats at the county and the city I've been uh, doing what I can uh, to help with it and so I appreciate you continuing to be an amazing voice for your community thank you um, Thank you, Marilyn, for joining. I'm um, happy to add the uh, Everett Film Fest to my Facebook page to help with uh, amplification um, and just sharing what, what, I've, what I can when I can. I also wanted to share that um, Housing Hope, uh, one of their social enterprise programs is Tomorrow's Hope Child Care Center, and they're doing a project share out uh, tomorrow for their new child care facility that they're uh, planning to put in at the Compass Health facility that's on Federal uh, near Forest Park. Uh, so they're planning on uh, putting in a new facility there to serve children and have also have a child care training program. And the city has used some of our ARPA dollars to help support that as well. So tomorrow from noon to 1.30, uh, they're doing a project share out about that. So I encourage neighbors to join. Um, it'll be at the Compass Health facility in building number two. And I was passed a, a note to share about the Rings and Roots Arbor Day ceremony. Uh, Wednesday, April 10th from 12.30 to 1.30 at Garfield Park, uh, located at 2300 Walnut Street in Everett, and folks are encouraged to join for a tree planting and refreshments, and students from Garfield Elementary will be joining uh, the City of Everett to celebrate Tree City, U our Tree City USA designation and Snohomish uh, PUD's Tree Line Award from the National Arbor Day Foundation, so folks are welcome to join for that. And last but not least, happy birthday, Angie. Thank you. Council Member Tui. Uh, yeah, I had an opportunity last week to meet with some of the leadership groups from, uh, from Delta and Northwest. Um, I think they've requested it from several of us um, to hear some of the issues that they have. And just um, it was a great opportunity to just kind of talk one on one with them. So that was great. And then we had our safe community uh, committee meeting this afternoon. And we. Um, Corey Hurt uh, went over the traffic safety camera implementation, which uh, Horizon School will be up and running starting April 3rd, um, and 30 days will be the trial period of time. And we talked about Council Member Fossey asked for the flyers that Council can give out to um, the neighborhoods that they go visit. So those will be, we decided, in Angie's office on the desk there. So if you guys go to a community meeting, um, pick some of those up and they have several languages so that's great um, the rest of the um, cameras will be up uh, during uh, during the summer so that will happen then and we also had a buffer zone update on the latest buffer zone so uh, Jose we are certainly hopeful that that you'll see a big difference so thank you for coming and sharing with that um, and that other than happy birthday Angie that concludes my comments Thank you. A um, couple things from, from me. I have, uh, I went to a couple neighborhood group meetings, um, the, went, visited the Harbor View, um, Seahurst, uh, a, a great presentation from the police department. Thank you, Chief. Um, what a, they just do a wonderful job. Um, a, lot of their, a lot of the conversations are around traffic and the speeds, especially Muckleteal Boulevard. Um, also uh, viewed the, uh, or went to the View Ridge and Madison neighborhood group. Also a lot of questions about traffic and speeds and um, a lot of questions about the Women and Children's Center that we're proposing to build on the on Glenwood and um, Suvers-Ducey Road. 
I also did attend with uh, Council Member um, Fossey the um, financial outdoor multi-purpose facility um, that we're looking at for place a home for the Aqua Sox and more, I hope. And just wanted to announce to the council that um, <clears throat> as part of the structure, uh, they were the eight of the voting members were to select a ninth person and they selected uh, Dan Leach. So that was a nice person. Nice, the ninth. Um, also, I just want to report, um, just as a, the council president, um, just to talk real briefly about our schedule. And I know you all got an email about the Levy Lidliff, um, kind of the schedule of meetings. Um, working with the mayor's staff, we um, went in a little deeper on like some of the subjects. And I'll send you an email, but I just want to just speak for the record there. Of course, t tonight's meeting is going to be a briefing on levy rates. Um, April 3rd, we're going to, um, the topics are going to be uses of a potential levy lid lift and levy rate and what service levels. Um, April 10th, we're going to review and have a refresher on the items that the city's been cutting or reducing or not spending for the last two decades, right? Um, on this April 17th, uh, we're going to hold a public meeting. Um, and so there'll just be a time to listen. That'll be the big night. And then my ask is um, if you have questions or you have input, this is also for those who are watching, um, the goal would be to get uh, everything in by April 19th. Of course, it can continue to go forever, but um, it would be good if staff could be prepared to respond to our questions and, and feedback um, from, from the public. And um, on the 24th, we're just going to have a discussion to review all that feedback and everything that you want to, that you've heard or your council of neighbors have told us or the emails you received. I know um, the mayor's office, they're going to be accumulating as much as they can. They might, they, they're not going to get everything. So bring, um, so we're going to have a discussion on public uh, comments and feedback on April 24th. Um, yeah, so that's that part. So thank you for that. Um, administration, do we have any updates? No, no. I, April 24th, we're also hopeful that uh, you might settle on, a, you know, uses amount rate, come to a decision, not just a discussion, but um, but that's our hope. So. Okay, I talked a lot. I figured they're going to get an email, but I just okay. wanted to generate Okay, good. Yeah, just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, yes. All right, uh, City Attorney, do we have anything? No report, no executive session. Okay. Um, all right, uh, before uh, consent items, uh, before we go forward, um, consent item number five and six have been requested to be put on the action item. And so we'll hear them after um, uh, our proposed action items. So at this time, I'm looking for a motion to uh, support consent items one, two, three, four, and seven. Council Member Ryan moves approval of consent agenda items one through four and seven. Second, Council Member Bader. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Um, clerk, we take the roll. Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Vice President Zerlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Bader? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Yes. Okay, on to proposed action item number eight. First reading, CB 2403-89. Adopt an ordinance closing a special improvement project entitled Everett Mall Way, 4th Avenue to East Mall Drive intersection, Safety Fund 303, Program 106, as established by Ordinance Number 3835-21, third and final reading 410-24. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay. Um, on to now action items, converted action items. Um, action item number five. Authorize the call um, for bids for the construction reservoir three, phase one repl replacement project. I'll move that item. Okay. Second motion. You second it. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? 
I have some questions. <laughs> uh, I understand that this is a uh, two-part um, a project. Is, is there any staff here that maybe could give us an overview of the difference of the phases? And then I have some follow-up questions on that. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, good. I, was like, I thought I saw Ryan back there. He is here. Um, so thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Good evening, Ryan Sass, Public Works. I also have Suhail Nasser here, who is our project manager on the project. In case you stumped me on a good technical question. Okay, so I uh, hope you'll indulge me a little bit of time because there's a, a kind of a, a bit of a narrative that I have to go through just to bring you up to speed. So in, in 2020, our comprehensive water plan uh, called for two projects related to Reservoir 3. It called for a structural retrofit to begin in about 2024 and a replacement to begin in about 2028. And so that was the path that we were on in terms of a two approach. The 2024 project was intended to you know, extend the life and get the maximum life we could out of it and to reduce its vulnerability to collapse under a seismic episode. Uh, as we started down that path and did study, what we found was that it was going to be probably not cost effective to do that seismic retrofit in that uh, it would, we would have spent three and a half to four million dollars and it wouldn't have necessarily been uh, beneficial in terms of extending the life of the structure. So at that point, uh, we pivoted uh, around the end of 2022, beginning at 23 to replace Reservoir 3 uh, on an urgent basis as quick as possible. So we started full design uh, for Reservoir 3 replacement. Um, in August of 2023, and during that time, we were monitoring the reservoir uh, for the problems that we had been observing. Basically, it's a 100-year-old reservoir tank with a lid that was placed on it in 87, and the uh, lid was crushing the old 100-year concrete, and so the uh, bearing surface for the beams that hold up the roof were eroding away, and some of them were just about gone. So in August of 2023, uh, we did an emergency re repair with a combination of city staff and contractor and dive team. I think I uh, included that in the council digest, so you might have seen some pictures of that. Uh, that was successful in that one location where we had the most uh, fear and concern about the reservoir roof. Uh, that confirmed the decision we had made earlier to go full speed ahead with uh, replacement of the reservoir. Now, the reservoir is required to be replaced in two phases because it's a terminal reservoir, and by that I mean it receives water continuously from our water filtration plant through the transmission lines, which has to have somewhere to go. So the approach is to build uh, one tank as fast as possible so that we can take the old tank out of service, and then the second phase will demo that uh, existing tank and replace it with a second tank, and we'll end up with two uh, seismically sound uh, concrete cylinder reservoirs at that location. Uh, let's see. So uh, on your agenda tonight, there are two items that are related, and they're related, uh, again, based on this idea of moving as fast as we can, and that we had first and second reading of our funding ordinance last week, third and final reading tonight, and we're doing, uh, requesting authorization to call for bids tonight as well in terms of going as fast as we can. So that's uh, why those two items are concurrent instead of having one next week. So. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's concurrent with, what is the item number on the other one? Creating the project, okay. So of, of, does it say on there with the second one, because I know it, it was 62 million for the whole entire cost, like what, how the phases were broken out and the cost of those? Yeah, the, the funding ordinance covers full design for both phases plus construction of phase one. And so the intent is that 
we'll build phase one and we'll continue with design for phase two and then we'll come back to council prior to construction of phase two. And so you'll be doing a call for bids later on that one. Okay. Um, and you guys did an analysis uh, deciding that a project labor agreement wasn't um, something you were pursuing for this phase? For phase one only. Yeah, we, uh, when we hired our consultant team, uh, HDR, we made sure that they had a sub-consultant to do PLA analysis for this project. And so, uh, which is really the ideal way to do it is to start that at the same time you're starting the, the project. So uh, we hired uh, Nancy Locke, who uh, is really the author of Seattle's Community Workforce Agreement and very much a proponent of project labor agreements. Uh, her analysis indicated then her recommendation and conclusions were that phase one should proceed without a PLA because it's urgent and needs to be, go as fast as possible and that phase two should definitely include a PLA. Um, the, the nice part about that is that we can begin that process as soon as this project is out for award so that that occurs concurrent with design so it doesn't add any additional length to the project. So um, at the time, have you guys provided us an update to the, since this is a major construction project, have you provided an analysis yet to council on regarding the use of the PLA? Yeah, I've commented a couple of times at council meetings that we intended that phase two of Reservoir 3 would likely be our first PLA project. I'm happy to provide a copy of the analysis that was done by Nancy Locke. And I'll just, uh, right now we're operating under the resolution, the PLA resolution mm -hmm. that was passed in 2019. 19. And that, uh, the way that resolution is drafted is if staff recommend a PLA that comes to council for approval well it, it said and and and, um, and so because phase one didn't have a PLA which is why you haven't seen the work for phase two yet you know it's the the resolution states that that only comes to council when we're recommending a PLA and we're not recommending a PLA for phase one it says, for major construction projects, city staff will brief the city council on city staff's analysis regarding the use of a project agreement. Uh, right? Let's see. Uh, so resolution 7461, which is the 2019 uh, PLA resolution, has really five main parts. Uh, the first is that we shall consider them for projects over $5 million in 2019 dollars. Uh, the second is a bunch of analysis points that will be analyzed, and the critical one here was, is 2E, which is need and urgency of the project and potential for public harm. I'm not debating the, the yeah, final yeah. analysis and the decision no, you came to. It's more about um, the, uh, for major construction projects um, that, and I remember watching the meeting, and I believe it was uh, Council Member Stonecipher who was um, adamant about like adding in that um, council will be given that information um, and, and its analysis regarding the use of a project agreement so I'm just I don't take that as in um, only when they decide to use one it's regarding the use on major construction projects um, so if, if it's possible to get more into the habit of providing those analysis is you know to us um, prior to these things ending up on the agenda, uh, that might, I'd like that. Certainly. No. Um, so point three of, of that resolution was that it was again to brief council upon council request. Uh, upon council request request am I missing I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't I can't it's too small for me to read it sorry I know that That's uh, and again I'm referring to 7461 which is the 2019 resolution yeah that's what I 
head up here. So regardless, uh, we can absolutely moving forward uh, do that. I think we were operating on under the uh, kind of guidance of this resolution, as well as uh, the fact that he's been briefing us on this project over the last several months with the clear direction that this phase will not have a PLA because of the urgency, but phase two will. But we, moving forward, we'll, you know, regardless of what states in that resolution, that just gives us, we would like you to do this, so I'm happy to direct them to do that. Yes, um, given this, uh, would love a briefing when you guys have those analysis. And if you could send me the analysis uh, and provide me a copy to just kind of look over. I'm not challenging yeah, yeah. the decision on it, but yeah, um, to I totally understand on the urgency side of things. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, when going um, to uh, look at the, I don't know how much you've decided what, um, I guess the provisions in the bid, how does that bid look different um, for like phase two than in the um, one that you're doing for phase one, as far as does that just have like a line item saying that a project labor agreement will be required? Uh, it'll be more than that because we will have negotiated a, you know, a labor agreement and then that will become part of the contract. So, you know, it'll be okay. substantially different in that regard. Okay. Um, for my own personal education, um, I probably would find it beneficial to, when you guys come to that point, to sit down and, and, and take time with staff to kind of understand a little bit more. Um, you know, this was phase one, and this is how it differs from phase two, um, just so I understand that bidding process a little bit different so I don't have to ask you guys so Certainly. many questions about it. I appreciate you coming up here on, on, on short notice and providing that background information. That was very, very helpful, all that detail. Um, the uh, So the current bid that's going out, um, and I know this isn't necessarily a requirement because you're not doing a project labor agreement for the first one, um, but is there anything in the bid um, that has one of the provisions that um, you guys had listed about um, the was, uh, apprenticeship? No, I think because uh, we already have a previous apprenticeship um, language um, from yeah. the previous ordinance. Yeah, I know you guys have that on there. I was just wondering if there was any difference. Um, I guess uh, on the apprenticeship, that is different on this project in that the current apprenticeship uh, ordinance that the city has doesn't apply to these types of projects, but the new state law does. And uh, Oh, so it doesn't apply to these ones? Why is that? It doesn't, but the, the state law that takes effect in July of 2024 does, and so any project awarded on or after July 1st is required to use uh, apprenticeships per the uh, new uh, state law. And so even though we anticipate this is likely to be awarded prior to July 1st, but not by a whole lot, it's um, prudent for us to include it for a bunch of reasons. It's a good thing to do. And also, there's no remedy. If you don't do it and you get delayed and you don't award it by July 1st, then there's no way to fix that. So. That's awesome. Um, and, and to our ordinance, um, we are waiting for feedback from... I know you guys are working on it. ...from uh, labor one mm -hmm. more time, and then we will have the apprenticeship ordinance back in front, and then I would, it would be my assumption, and Jennifer can correct me if I'm wrong, that we, it will be better aligned with the state apprenticeship. That's awesome. Um, what was it that, in particular, why did it exclude public works? Yeah, it, it excluded public works. It was specific okay. to city facilities, uh, but not including public works type facilities, utility That's facilities. Okay. It was focused okay. on city building projects. Um, I have one more question. Um, How much was the cost um, of the uh, phase one? Phase one estimated construction cost is 42 million approximately. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and if it's 62, so the second part is around 20. No, the, the 62 is the all in cost of all of the study, all of the design work, uh, construction of phase one plus design work of phase two. And then uh, when we're 
at this point with phase two, when we've got the design complete, we'll update that cost and bring in another ordinance to update it for construction. Okay. I, I expect that that one will be, it's a, it'll be a larger project than phase one because the volume of the reservoir is bigger, the second reservoir is bigger, and it includes demolition and removal of the old existing reservoir. Okay. Um, is there anything in um, our current outgoing bid that um, request request for bids uh, that specifies or um, encourages the contractor and subcontractor to hire local workers? I don't believe we have priority hire, uh, local hire, uh, anywhere in our current ordinances or, or bid requirements. We do have uh, various disadvantaged business enterprise encouragements and whatnot, but I don't believe we have uh, local hire provisions. Okay. And are, are you expecting that will be fixed by the future PLA ordinance, or is that not something that is allowed to do in our... So we're, we're, the apprenticeship ordinance is the one that's coming back first. I think we're still a ways off from having the PLA um, ordinance ready, so we're still operating under this one, but Jennifer is the kind of more well, this would be internal of, expert. Yeah. Um, we have looked at uh, a priority or higher concepts for, for both um, the apprenticeship uh, draft ordinance and um, where we were last at with the PLA before we kind of refocused to try to push the apprenticeships over the finish line, so. And so that's not something that people generally, entities generally include in any of their uh, requests for bids is that we have priority it higher. Can, it can be more common at a larger jurisdiction where the pool of priority folks would be bigger. So a county-wide um, apprenticeship ordinance or county-wide PLA, King County has one like that. Um, well, I mean, like, it, it, but it's it, tougher. Excluding a, since this is not under a PLA, uh, uh, like actually having priority higher in your, when you're asking for that bid, having that be yeah. part of the requirement. It, it's very uncommon outside of a PLA or community workforce agreement. But that being said, it it's certainly not exclusive to PLAs. There's no reason that. Uh, the city or any entities, if they chose to do that, could do that regardless of whether it was in, inside a PLA or not. Okay. And uh, <coughs> Council Mayor Fossey, uh, that language and how it's written is definitely was part of the, mm -hmm. <coughs> part of our discussion continuously. Yeah. And um, with labor, we were kind of asking for them to, they have some concerns over it for them to come up with some language that would fit the, both the needs because it's something that council member two and I both uh, really would want along with that was like some sort of reporting requirements to see whatever <coughs> that requirement would be to see what the effects would be on the projects. So thank you for your comments. Yeah, my, my um, uh, primary concern is just the size of this phase mm -hmm. one and I understand time constraints with not uh, having a full on PLA and things like that, but um, that we don't have any of these positive aspects um, included perhaps maybe in our bidding efforts and our request for bids saying that these are things that um, our city prioritizes on the work that we do, especially of projects this size, for instance, priority hire of mm -hmm. local workers and so the workers around here actually get to do that work. But um, that's just one example, so that's, a missed opportunity, I think, um, but I understand as far as not being able to use a PLA in um, these short emergency circumstances. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer the questions. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, Council Member Zarlingo. A brief question uh, to make sure I understand the, the urgency of this. It sounds like the reservoir lid has been failing under just its normal static loads and weather conditions. We have been then for some time vulnerable to a medium or larger kind of seismic event and will be until reservoir um, till the first phase is till the first phase is done so we would if there was that kind of thing we would see a really dramatic water problem and draconian restrictions and okay i want to understand the urgency thank you and uh, i just one more question do you have an estimated value of phase two 
I don't, but I, again, I do expect it to be somewhat larger than phase one. Uh, again, phase one current dollars being 42 million, and it will be larger than that based on the scope. Great, thank you. Okay, with, uh, unless there's any more questions, um, Clerk, will you take the roll? Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Vice President Zerlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogeli? Yes. Councilmember Bader? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Yes. Okay, now we are on to action item uh, number six, authorize the mayor to sign a professional agreement, services agreement with, uh, nope, I'm sorry, we already did that one. Is that right? Is that the right one? Yeah. I got too many scratches here on my, <laughs> authorize the mayor to sign professional service agreements with Pace Engineers Incorporated. No. Okay, you guys said it was the right one. Okay, all right. Authorize the mayor to sign amendment number two um, to the professional services agreement with um, Common Street Consulting LLC. And that was item number six. Is there any questions? Uh, do you need a motion first on that one? Oh yeah, thank you. I'll say, I, I move motion, or item number six. I second the motion. Okay, thank you guys for keeping me straight. Now, are there any questions? Yes, uh, I think a lot Council, of these. Council Member Vogeli. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of these may be for Susie. I see that Julie has uh, come up. Um, but it really has a lot to do with uh, the budget and um, questions in regards to finances, which is, you know, a priority of the council. And um, why don't you ask and we'll see who's best suited to answer? Oh, I will. Um, do you want to turn on your mic so everybody can hear you? I just said, why don't you ask and see who's best suited? Julie's very much the expert on this project, but yeah, if there's details, Susie's here too. Great. Um, and then we also got a letter today. So I am reading through it right now from one of the past residents. So I really encourage, I don't know if y'all got it actually, uh, it came to council. So I'm not sure if administration got it. So I will send it through. Um, so there was a question. Okay, first of all, I do know that this is an amendment to extend the contract without any financial, any more financial obligations. So I am in understanding that that is what it is for. And it needs to go from, well, no, I don't remember, but until August of this year. Um, and some questions that I have asked that haven't been answered to my uh, can't think of that word right now. How much money is the city prepared to pay for relocation and ongoing services for all of the parties involved in the Waits property acquisition scenario? And it's possible that that was not understood um, when I asked it in that way because I got the answer for a total budget of $260,349. And then the budget for consulting, which is why we're here, is actually for $260,000, $349,000. But according to the scope of work, that money pays for hours worked and mileage. And so what is the budget for ongoing services such as rent and moving fees? Um, does the rent if we should choose as a city to pay part of the rent for people when they get relocated. Um, does that come out of the consultant's budget of the 260 or does that come from somewhere else? The 260 is for the common street contract. Additional funds that we would use for relocation would be out of the CIP for fund. And where does one find that information when it is paid or asked for to be paid? Um, all payments 
all payments to Common Street would be done uh, through our accounts payable system and it would be uh, um, recorded in our city's financial system. I think she's talking about the other payments. She has got the, every month she gets the invoices and so she's pretty much aware of, of when we pay Common Street. So I'm, at, I'm wondering if you're asking more about how, are you asking for specific information about the individual relocation expenses? No, shall I get out the invoice? Because within the invoice, it has mileage, and it has things such as locks um, for, I think there's one receipt for locks and another receipt for storage, which is quite blurry actually once it's printed out. Um, there has not yet been any information given to the Everett City Council about how much this is going to cost the city of Everett. And so we know that the land was purchased, condemned for $1.85 million. There will be a budget amendment coming up, the first budget amendment of the year. Um, to I, I know we paid for that, in 2023 actually that was in uh, January of 24 oh okay okay and so there and lies the budget amendment so that's coming in which is not part of the two hundred and sixty thousand three hundred and forty nine dollars for Common Street that we are discussing today but it is indeed part of relocation and ongoing services for all parties involved in the Waits property acquisition scenario. So that is one thing. Well, again, I think that the, the very few expenses that have been on Common Street's invoices were probably at the beginning, again, I don't know exactly when we made those, and I'm happy to look back and to tell you exactly what they were paid for. But sometimes it was easier for them to make an immediate decision to add some lock because that's what they agreed upon with the, the person that they were working with. But by and large, the $260,000 is only for their services to help with relocation. And then to date, we have spent approximately $37,000 in additional funds on a non, um, on temporary motels, on uh, applications for rent or, you know, for rental applications. Um, first month's rent for some people, deposits, last month's rent, whatever we agreed with them was the financial package that they wanted in order to be relocated. So that's that also includes any money that we've had to pay for utilities at the Waits Motel since we took ownership on January 12th. So PUD bills, um, water bill, uh, Puget Sound Energy. Puget Sound Energy. We actually didn't get a bill yet. The, interestingly, when we contacted them after we were made aware of the announcement, they hadn't even sent us a bill yet. We had no back payments that we owed them. We will be getting a bill from them in April, and we will be paying it. So the $37,000 um, for like temporary motel stays and rental applications, that's coming from the Common Street. Con mm. That is coming from the CIP4 fund. Correct. That will be in addition to the Common Street Consulting contract. Um, I think, if I understand, uh, the gist of this conversation is that those are costs related directly to helping the former residents relocate. So, as Julie pointed out, we're paying future rent. We're paying um, motel stays in the interim. Uh, perhaps some moving fees, storage fees, stuff like that. And we're utilizing our city processes. So we have the documentation, the, we're using the P-card system that our procurement um, office regulates and monitors in order to do it the way that legally we need to. Okay, have any of the residents been given a list of services that could be possibly provided? It's virtually impossible to give all of the residents one list of services that would be provided to them. Okay. So, thank you. Um, so, 
a question that I've been answer, a, asking since the beginning is what relocation law applies to the long-term residents of the waits? Because you did mention that there could be future rent, um, there's motel stays until they get all of that. Um, an answer that we got on August 2nd was applicable here is the Federal Uniform Relocation Assistance and Real Property Acquisition Policies Act of 1970 and the Washington counterpart to that statute, C49 CFR 24, Chapter 8.26 RCW and Chapter 468-100 WAC. And another answer on August 30th was the city will be following the law. And in many other times and instances, the answer has been that the city will be following the law and we are given various RCWs and um, such. And then in an answer to that question uh, in an email dated, well, today, um, it says, correct, relocation law does not apply. And should the city and a particular resident not come to an agreement, I have been told by the city attorney there is no legal recourse for that resident. Uh, end quote, and then beginning of another quote, the city is not a landlord, RCW 59.18.085, which is part of the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, does not apply. Um, and so the reason I'm asking about all of the services that may or may not be available to any or all of the residents um, I'm asking for those because not yet have I found for a resident to have any recourse um, when it was provided to the city council at the very beginning that we would indeed be um, following the law. And there is no law to follow. And so I would like for there to be a service list of sorts. Um, I have seen like we might and we may and then this particular um, this particular agreement. Councilmember Vogel, do you yeah. have a question for staff? I think we have two or three people poised to try to address what you're asking and the longer okay. it goes it's harder How is for the budget for consulting the entire budget for weights relocation purchase and future use? Over the next several weeks, staff will begin gathering cost estimates for possible next steps. When will these items, like cost estimates, testing, assessments, come to council for financial approval? So that will have to come to you, just as you probably was said at the time that you just, you know, that quote that you read, I'm sure that's what we were saying at the time and that's what we would say tonight. Um, a future use uh, would come to council. We were just reflecting that this has taken longer uh, than one might have anticipated so i don't think we have a date for when we might bring a future use um, to you guys but it will happen before it can proceed i also just i think that it's useful to note the sentence that came before the part that you read council member vocally about mm -hmm. no legal recourse and that is that each resident situation is unique and as long as the individuals are working to establish a move out plan city has no plans to terminate an offer of assistance so we do want to continue working with which each of each of each of those residents there have been two that have been relocated two units i don't know the people um and curious when they're when we're going to find out that's not the question um Two people have been relocated and it has been brought to my attention that they may be homeless again. Um, and I know that there is a letter from legal to folks saying if you get evicted or break the law in a place where we have temporarily relocated you, there will be no more services available. Um, and I believe every resident got I can get the letter out. I know what you I know okay. what you're talking about. Uh, so my question, um, and this is from a person that wrote in, um, will there be a request 
No, she requests a service list, like as in having a menu at, or not having a menu at a uh, restaurant. You don't know what you can ask for if you don't know what's on the menu. Um, she also requests that people be available on days other than Saturday and just two days a week. And that stress and trauma of this situation should be considered uh, as a sickness. And Council ahead. President, I'm going to call for the question here on this uh, motion. Um, okay. You know what? As According to, to that, uh, our charter, we've got to take a vote. Okay, call for a question. Normally has uh, no room for debate, and um, it's a simple majority. This is literally the first time I've ever heard of this. Can we get a uh, clarification on what that means, please? I don't have my Robert's Rules of Order in front it's of me. It's not Robert's Rules of Order. It's in our charter. Okay. And it, it says... Does, yeah. It does come from Robert's Rules and Council yeah. President... We don't Schwab follow it, Robert's right? Rules. There's, okay. That's the source it of it. From. Yeah. So just to Council Member Ryan's question, uh, that's the source of that. There isn't debate on a motion to call for the question. I always hated it because you got to vote again and it's like oh can we just vote one time but that is how it works the the clerk would just call the roll and if there's a majority then you would vote on the motion that's on the table um, that is i don't know if there's a nuance related to the charter but that's how that works and council president had it right so that so essentially it shuts down shuts discussion down. and no moves debate. straight to the void and no you can't thing. debate on the question either on the call you just vote on it so if it's useful a yes vote means no further questions or debate, and you'd move to the vote on the on the motion. And a no vote means you would just continue discussion, continue questions. Thank you. Okay. So call for question, um, Councilmember Fossey. Yes means we'll stop debate. No <laughs> means we'll continue. Uh, no. Councilmember Zalingo. Yes. No. Councilmember Bader. Yes. Councilmember Ryan. No. Councilmember Tui. Yes. And uh, I'll vote uh, no, uh, but with could we have some discretion? Can we just click finish it up? Yes. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions besides me or commentary? Okay, I will move over to Councilmember Ryan. Are, are you finished then? It just as a point of order, I mean, as a point of order, I would like to have some short questions so they can answer them and then we can kind of go on. I appreciate your commentary and your um, passion for this issue, but if there's something we can just clean up, that would be good. Yes, so. thank you. I am looking for a budget that council can approve or not approve regarding this entire situation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ryan. You had a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, to go back to the point about uh, especially the motion that's before us about the timeline um, and approving an extension to the timeline. Uh, so it had been originally shared that uh, it was the city would be helping with relocation for 42 months. And then the email that we got today said that the relocation does not apply. Uh, the current contract is until April 1st, uh, but the residents are required to be moved out by April 30th and the motion is for August 1st extension. So I'm unclear on the timeline of um, how <laughs> things have changed over time um, and why an extension isn't lining up more closely with the April 30th move out date, which I assume would be when uh, Common Street would be wrapping up their services and providing final invoices and all that fun stuff. And then also if there is still, if there's any resident where the 42 month relocation rule does apply. I think that one of the things that we need to be clear on is that we are all learning. We've never done this before and some of the information that was provided to us at the beginning about the International Relocation Act doesn't apply, but we didn't know that at, at the beginning. We wanted to go into this with as much legal guidance as we possibly could, but we've continued to learn more and understand more and utilize Common Street to help 
the residents. That has been our first and foremost. And some of these individuals have been readily available or readily willing to move, to relocate to a temporary living environment. And then we can't force them to continue to work with Common Street. They can change their mind. They can decide they don't want to respond. They can res decide they're not available on a Saturday. And that prolongs our ability to help them. And some of the residents haven't either been able to move from the Waits Motel or haven't chose to engage with Common Street. So it's a very complex, ever-changing, daily amount of work. And so because it doesn't cost us any more money, Common Street does have great relationships with several of the residents and have helped many people to move out. And so we want to continue to be able to help and support the residents that Common Street is working with. And so that's simply all we're asking for tonight. Thank you. Okay, no more questions. Um, uh, Clerk, will you take the roll? Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Vice President Zarlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Bader? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Yes. Okay, on to action item number nine. I'll read the third and final reading, CB 2403-87, adopt an ordinance reducing the number of members of the Citizen Advisory Committee and renaming the committee as the Community Development Advisory Committee. A lot of committees in there. Oh, Scott, Councilmember Bader moves. That second the motion. Okay, here, motion to second. Any questions? Okay, hearing none, Clerk, will you take the roll? Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Council Vice President Zarlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Bader? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Yes. Uh, Item, action item number 10, CB 2403-88, third and final reading, adopt an ordinance creating a special improvement project entitled Reservoir Number 3, replacement, fund 336, program 016, and repealing ordinance number 3914-22. Councilmember Bader, so moves. Second the motion. Okay, there's a motion to second. Any questions? Clerk, will you take the roll? Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Vice President Zerlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Bader? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Yes. Uh, action item number 11, authorize the mayor to sign a professional agreement PSA with HDR Engineering Incorporated for the 2024 comprehens comprehensive cost of service study. So moved. Second. Okay, motion and second. Any questions? Councilmember Fossey. So uh, I know that we have things that are in um, our municipal code regarding um, late fees and charges and things that are past due and what we charge actual residents for different things. Um, and it may not be something that ties into this neatly. So if that's the case, um, we can look at it separately. But um, given that we're outside of, you know, the, um, during the pandemic, taking a very light approach to residents and, um, and not enforcing, you know, some of those immediate like late fees. And I, I believe uh, the city took an approach that was very respectful to everybody. And and coming out of that, and now um, moving back into you know normal practice, is do we have any background or any information about the specific uh, approaches to fees, fines, late fees, uh, the practice, the time period, or anything like that that gives kind of an assessment of how that relates to other okay yes. uh, good evening again uh, also I wanted to I, some of you may have met Jamie Lee Graves before she's our public works budget manager and so if you haven't I wanted to introduce her um, as you're aware this is uh, a, a rate setting year for us this is a revisitation for the next a preparation for the next four-year utility rate uh, we do a four-year rate ordinance, and so this is the the contract before you tonight is the very beginning of that at cost of service study where we have an independent third party do a cost of service analysis, and then that's the first step in building that next rate structure going forward. Um, trying to get more specific to your answer, 
you know, after uh, we got some relief in terms of uh, COVID funds and applied that to many of the accounts that had large uh, balances in arrears uh, and resolved most all of those. And then gradually we have transitioned back to operating by all of our standard ordinances. And so uh, the rate setting uh, process doesn't specifically uh, on an itemized basis address those. They're addressed in various ordinances, but at the same time, it's an appropriate time to, uh, you know, for us to hear of uh, any kind of changes to that or, or what kind of direction you might have as we go forward in that process. Okay, and what would be the proper avenue to request that or to provide the feedback? I'd say you know, direct feedback would be great, and you know I'm sure Jennifer would be happy to receive it and distribute it to us, and we can respond accordingly. Fantastic, thank you. Any other questions, Councilmember Ryan? Thank you. Uh, so thinking ahead for the timeline, since these uh, rates are expiring at the end of the year, is it expected that the study will bring? Um, recommendations which will lead to an ordinance which we will then approve by the end of the year yeah we've got a, we're developing a, uh, a briefing agenda uh, starting with administration and council as we work between now and the end of the year with a, a goal of completing a updated rate ordinance by about the end of the year yeah, so it'd be October 2nd would be um, the first reading and then the 9th and then the 16th Seems like lightning speed for government. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> um, yeah, if they're I'd, not on the built environment committee, but it might be a good place, a stopping ground in the middle, too, for a preview as well. So thank you. Okay. Um, no further questions. Um, Clerk, will you please take the roll? Councilmember Fossey? Yes. Vice President Zerlingo? Yes. Councilmember Vogley? Yes. Councilmember Bader? Yes. Councilmember Ryan? Yes. Councilmember Tui? Yes. President Schwab? Clerk, and yes, uh, clerk, just to reaffirm that the consent items one, two, three, four, and seven, and then five and six were um, converted to action items. Correct. Okay, and so, and nine, okay, that's it. I just want to make sure we're good. Thank you very much. All right, our last item today, item number 12, um, revenue options, and we're so thank you full you're here even though it's your last year of retirement and um but we're going to spend a lot of late evenings together in the next couple months so thank you for being here no oh, thank you very much mm -hmm. uh so here we are again uh we're going to follow up on uh some of the questions that came up about the property tax levy lid lift tonight um i'm going to start with uh providing some information on what properties might be exempt entirely from property tax and then also some of the property tax as payment assistant programs that exist out there um, and then i'll uh, dive back into uh, more data on the property tax lived lift so government properties and certain nonprofit organizations are exempt from paying property tax uh, nonprofits, even though they may be exempt from federal income tax, are not generally exempt from taxes in Washington State. Typically, organizations must own and exclusively use their property to conduct uh, an activity specifically exempted by the state legislature to qualify for the exemption. Examples, some of the examples include uh, schools, churches, cemeteries, hospitals, nursing homes and performing arts facilities uh, are among the lists that I have up there for you tonight. And there are four main programs that are available to assist low-income homeowners uh, pay their property taxes. Two that provide tax assistance for uh, specifically widows or widowers of veterans, and then also one, of, uh, one program for just generally low-income homeowners. Uh, there are two tax deferral programs, which uh, must eventually repay the property tax that was paid on their behalf uh, by the Department of Revenue. Um, and those 
those repayments would kick in uh, when specific life events had happened, such as the sale of the property. There's a small list of life events that would trigger that repayment. And we will definitely be providing links to more information on eligibility requirements and how one could apply for these programs on our website uh, so that it is available for homeowners to gather more information and perhaps if they might qualify, actually apply for these programs. So next up is the lid lift. And uh, I know I showed this chart before. In fact, I show it every year with the uh, annual property tax ordinance, but I thought it was a, a appropriate time to have another review. Uh, so this chart shows the overall all effect of the 1% limit on property tax growth. Uh, and I'm showing it just to provide some context around the amounts that the city is considering requesting from our voters. As I've previously noted, the 1% limit is the primary cause of the city's structural deficit. The levy lid lift that's under review would be one important step towards resolving that long-standing issue. This chart illustrates the impact of inflation and the 1% limit on property taxes. The time span begins in 2001 when the uh, limitation was first enacted and extends out to 2023. The Consumer Price Index, or CPI, is the measure of inflation used to produce this chart. And although CPI is not a perfect measure of inflation or those external forces that drive the growth in the cost of providing public services, it is relevant to our labor contracts and many of the contracts that we have with external suppliers. Industry-specific areas that significantly exceed CPI include construction costs for maintaining the city's infrastructure, health care, and the cost of technology. The blue columns in this chart start with $1 in 2001 as the base year. That $1 is then deflated over the years by the difference between CPI and the 1% growth limit until by 2023, the value of that dollar in terms of how much we can buy with it declines to only 57 cents. So for every dollar in property tax the city had in 2001 to fund core services, we can now only pay for about 57 cents of those same services. And the two charts on this slide show what the percent increase would be relative to the total property tax bill for the average value home. The left chart shows the percent increase in the columns and the corresponding dollar amount on a monthly basis along the bottom. The chart on the right shows the same information with the dollar increase shown in annual amounts along the bottom. So for this presentation, we have, uh, we're adding the monthly view in addition to the annual view that we had been talking about in previous presentations. So note also that each chart has a vertical red dashed line before the green first screen column, which is there as a reminder that making meaningful progress in closing the budget gap would require a lift amount that is to the right of that line. So walking through the chart on the left, a 5.6% increase in the average uh, value homes total tax bill would be less than $20, $21 per month or $250 per year. A 6.7% increase would be $25 a month or about $300 per year and so on. On this slide, the chart on the left shows the potential deficit reduction in red in the red to green columns, which correspond to the estimated monthly impacts on the average value property along the bottom. So for example, an estimated $13.1 million reduction would cost the average value property, again, just under $21 per month. And a $15.7 million estimated deficit reduction would cost that same property about $25 per month. And the chart on the right, shows the number of years that the lift could support the delivery of core services until the deficit would return, 
based on the same average value property impacts. So based on the current forecast, a $13.1 million reduction would hold off the return of the deficit for about one year, and a $15.7 million reduction would extend that period for an additional year for a total of two years. To get up to five years of deficit relief would cost the average value property about $33 per month. Susie, can I interject just real quickly? And I, I want to be clear, your, your projections include inflation going forward for current level of core services, but it doesn't include an increase in services in any area where people are often asking, are you going to add more support for neighborhoods? Are you going to add more here? It doesn't include any of those additions, but it does include inflation. That's correct. Okay. And here um, I've brought the four charts together on one slide to hopefully help in the discussion and I would like to pause for a moment for questions. Council Member Ryan. Thank you. Uh, as a note, the presentation that's linked on the Agenda Center online is I think an older version. This is a different version. So uh, for public records purposes, if the most current could be added, that'd be great. Um, so I was trying to wrap my head around the percentages, and I left a, mm -hmm. we uh, exchanged voicemails about it. So the slide where it shows the estimated percentage of uh, increase in total tax bill. Um, so for a taxpayer to have their bill go up 5.6%, but with the city of Everett's portion only being 18% of their total bill, I'm was trying to figure out the math on that of how much that 18% is increasing to then have their total bill go up 5.6% or whatever the correlation is. In this presentation, I haven't put together a slide that shows the increase just in the city's regular levy. Mm -hmm. um, this is from the perspective of what is the total tax bill that each resident is paying every year. Um, I think that the thought on that behind that is that would be a little bit easier for people to understand because when they're paying their tax bill they're writing one check to the assessor's office and they're I think that they're very interested in knowing well how much is how much bigger is that check going to have to be as a result of this action if uh, it receives voter approval so it, you're correct this mm -hmm. is the percentage increase on their total tax bill which for this particular value home in 2024 was, I believe, $4,471. So if you're looking at, um, for example, a $250 increase or, that they would be paying in 25, based on that $4,471, that would be 5.6%. Um, the calculation would obviously be quite different if we were just focusing on the increase in the city's levy. I think that um, it, would, it would be more difficult for people to understand the, the impact of what we would be asking. Thank you. Yeah, I, I see it a little bit differently. When I uh, talk with constituents about property taxes and the levy lid lift, and I mentioned that you know we're considering options that might raise our levy rate two or three percent, their automatic response is, oh, my, my bill's going up two or three percent. And so it's not, it's so I hear residents think of it as like a one to one ratio of like the city's uh, levy rates going up one percent, therefore my tax bill's also going up one percent. So if I'm picturing a ballot measure and that's asking voters to allow the city to raise our levy by two or three percent. Um, and I think from that point, the uh, residents would need to have the understanding that even though the city's portion is going up two or three percent, that's a different number than what their uh, rates or what their bill total bill is going to be going up. You know, so the, the ballot measures usually don't wouldn't be a two or three. That wouldn't be the language. It would be the levy rate. So it would say like our levy rates. No, I don't know what it is. I've looked at the slides of hundred the million times, Do but dollar fifty two. Dollar fifty two. Mm -hmm. This measure would increase that dollar fifty two to whatever correlates to this information. If that is 
just something to think about because it won't say that that wouldn't be on the ballot the okay. percentage thing um, so we can provide certainly the the amount the percentage increase that all of this would be just relative to the city's regular levy uh, that obviously is going to be a much larger number because we're talking about a much smaller amount mm -hmm. that you're comparing with so if we're, we're asking for $250 a year and the regular levy for this house is, uh, I want to say it's 700 and I don't have it in here with me, but it was like 760. Is it on the pie chart? Oh, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Good. 793? 793, 93, yes. I just want to yes. clarify here. These, these percentages here on this chart are the for the full dollar amount. The full property tax, not just the city's right. amount. So what you see is uh, that green piece of the pie that's pulled out um, shows the dollar amount that's just for the Everett regular levy. So that is $793. And you see all of the, um, the bullet points below. So in, that's not going to work. Um, right below the pie, you'll see schools is... Um, Three thousand thirty-seven dollars. EMS is one ninety-five. Everett is seven ninety-three. Port is ninety-eight. The county's two sixty-two, and RTA is eighty-six. You add that together, and you get the four thousand four hundred seventy-one dollars. And the bar chart is the total bill. Mm -hmm. And the bar, the what yeah. what we're giving you the percentage increase on mm -hmm. is a comparison of what is, for example, two hundred and fifty dollars in comparison to. Uh, the, what would they be paying more on top of the 4,471? Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Council Member Chewy. Yeah, Susie, the, uh, the only thing that's kind of confused, might be confusing, is that there are other factors that could increase in people's property tax in addition to the city of Everett. Mm -hmm. So if we say we're only going to raise your taxes by 5%, well, the school district and the county and everything else could also raise and so that picture could be different when reality so that could be kind of hard to to show that is it, it yeah. would be and uh, quite frankly we wouldn't have the information available to us to predict what's going to happen in all of these other taxing right. districts so um, there most likely would be some other at least the one percent mm -hmm. right on the part of the other taxing districts although perhaps not all of them would take their one percent i re we really can't speak for them um, but that goes into a, a level of financial detail that we just don't have yeah council member zarlingo well um kind of as a for everett residents kind of a counter to that is that um it depends on what happens in everett versus other cities and other parts of the county and uh, talking to the assessor i think it was a year or so ago everett had seen lower assessments the assessed value uh, by the what well, saw a larger decline than the rest of the county so many of us who saw a big increase last year saw a decrease this year that seems to be flat or down over various chunks of the city and those numbers up and down dwarf the kinds of numbers we're talking about here i bring this up because I think it is an additional complexity in trying to explain things and, and an inability to predict all of those things. But uh, wherever it saw some significant increases, now we've seen some some decreases. And I, myself, I'm in discussing with constituents, I think the uh, given our inability to explain that level of detail and an inability to predict that future, um, I'm inclined to focus this on what what our constituents have asked us, which is what are you what are you doing for us, what are the services, and then what are the choices in terms of what we might pay versus those levels of services or cuts. So I guess I will lean in that direction um, in explaining this stuff wherever we can. I, I think it's a good point, though, um, that what we're presenting here is um, all things being equal, this is what this action would take um, outside of what any other taxing district might be planning for 
And, and one last comment. Thank you for bringing up the uh, measures with respect to tax relief, because one thing I've also seen in our community meetings is that people who are concerned about tax loads for them is often elderly and low income. Uh, they aren't all by any stretch aware of those kinds of programs. Yeah, I think that's very true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so um, last slide is our recommendation. And uh, so we were hoping that tonight we might receive some direction regarding limiting the range of choices that we've been presenting in this analysis. Um, and then hopefully somewhere near uh, April 10th that the council might at least select a uh, levy lid lift amount as a placeholder to move the process forward so they can the outside council can begin the work on the ballot measure and that uh, concludes what i have for you tonight and i believe we'll be back next week to discuss uses and um, purposes purpose any questions at this point is it any discussion on a range that we want to look through could could you throw up that well, couple of those slides there? Okay. Is there any way you can? Right. A any discussion on on limiting the rate? Oh, good. Councilmember Ryan. I'll go first. Yeah. Um, I think that um, all of the options to the left of the red dotted line should no longer be considered. Um, Mayor Franklin has done an incredible job of having uh, going through the budget to cut things that were very difficult and we all know that there's nothing left to cut and we need to solve this problem instead of just kicking the can down the road. Um, so I would suggest uh, not considering the options on the left anymore because we need to uh, move forward with providing minimum core services for the community. Okay. Any other discussion? Councilmember Vogley. I concur with Councilmember Ryan. Thank you for the short response. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other comments? Councilman Bader. Um, worried that if we don't go a little further to the right, that that doesn't give us enough time to regroup if other options should not come to fruition. And that we might need to go at least to the, between the two and the three on the right hand chart, two and three years. Mm -hmm. Good point. Council Member Zarlingo. Well, concur. I think it would be embarrassing to come back a year later and say, well, we solved it for a year after all this questions about trade-offs and interaction with our community. Mm -hmm. Council Member Ryan. Thanks. I, th um, I meant to add, too, that I think with buying us at least a year or two, that gives us the uh, gift of time to thoughtfully think through the RFA, uh, library annexation and the other measures that we should be considering as well so we aren't put in a uh, time crunch to to make our way through those other options I, councilmember zarlingo <laughs> also as i've seen this over the past two and a half years our landscape with respect to other taxes and sales taxes has also been not quite what we expected and another one of those things that's unpredictable so to Councilmember Ryan's point I guess this would give us some time to see where we're at on those other balances uh, for funding our city um, and j just for my comment for myself um, and council members this is a, a good discussion about um, asking more specifics from those we represent and uh, we're, we're hoping to to make a decision on that range um, on the 10th so that's that's coming up pretty quick too mm -hmm. we have a pretty compressed timeline yeah. so think about that also if that's um, if we need to put that off or is that a time to, to you know let, let me know through email and through just if this is if that schedule is going to work for you guys so I just want to make sure that we've understood so what the there's not a I don't think we need to vote but what we're hearing from all those that have uh, spoke uh, on this is that options uh, uh, in the green not the kind of muted sagey green but the, the two three and five year uh, 
numbers are, are the ones that we should continue to explore for your consideration in the next couple of weeks. I would Seeing like to nodding. continue with one also. You'd like to continue yeah. with one as well? Okay. So everything left of the line we'd like removed, I think is the message I'm hearing. Okay, good. That's a start. Good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, without any further action, meeting adjourned.